And welcome back to day two of See It, Stop It, Tackling Abuse in Amateur Sports, presented by the Foundation for Global Sports Development and Sidewinder Films. This symposium is designed to empower coaches, parents, athletes, and administrators in recognizing and preventing abuse in sport. Sport should be a place where athletes feel safe and, and supported. The Foundation for Global Sports Development is committed to ensuring this happens. To end abuse in sport, we must completely shift our culture to make athlete safety and well being our top priority. If you weren't able to attend yesterday's session around abuse prevention and healthy, positive coaching, the recordings will be available for viewing on their website at globalsportsdevelopment.org. Today's panel, Institutional Accountability, the Power of One Voice, speaks to how institutions such as universities and organizations play a critical role in keeping athletes safe. We will explore strategies for supporting survivors, creating protection policies, and learning how to be institutional change makers at an individual level. So there's a place where we'll give some information and hopefully get some feedback from you. Uh, and maybe you'll even join us as partners for change. Um, this discussion obviously can be somewhat triggering. So we encourage you to practice self-care. Uh, feel free to call anonymously or text Child Help Hotline it's 1-800-422-4453. You can get immediate help and speak to a professional crisis counselor. Um, they're also there just to answer questions. So even if you're not in crisis uh, and you're just feeling a little bit uncomfortable or want some more resources, they're there for you. Please join our resources session directly following the discussion at 1215. Pacific to learn more about national and local resources, training, certification, and how to get answers to some pressing questions. And if you have any questions for our panelists, please enter them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I am Daphne Young, Chief Communications Officer at Child Health. This is my 11th anniversary at this wonderful organization and eighth year working with GSD on projects that have directly impacted over 160,000 children, coaches, parents, uh, youth in sports, uh, members of the community, and uh, even politicians working in the field uh, through a program called Child Help Speak Up Be Safe for Athletes underwritten by the Foundation for Global Sports Development. Uh, today, our esteemed panelists are Jonathan Vaughn. Great to see you again, Jonathan. Good to see you. That's an award-winning uh, and a former Michigan uh, football player and abuse survivor who went on to play in the NFL and NFL Europe. He's now an entrepreneur, father, activist, and he's committed to ending sexual abuse by educating others and supporting statute of limitations reform in Michigan and other legislation aimed at safeguarding youth. This is a guy I saw just recently on ESPN on a mic calling out the Board of Regents in the University of Michigan. He said, uh, say my name because the time is now for all of you who have been abused here to speak up for justice. We speak because every victim matters. I am not John Doe, I am John Vaughn. And um, I just wanna tell you, John, that when our brother survivors come forward, um, it, it legitimizes and gives voice to every woman that's been abused and uh, some of the children that are still in the shadows of abuse. It, it matters deeply. And so we thank you for that. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Uh, professor Giora, Amos, uh, Amos Giora is a professor of law at SJ Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah. His uh, research contributed to legislation ratified by the Utah legislature and signed into law on March 23, 2021. So these guys are both uh, recent happening and on the cutting edge of this work. Uh, the law criminalizing bystanders who do not intervene on behalf of children and vulnerable adults. He will be testifying before the Victoria and Australia Legislative Council regarding the crime of omission. And I just found a quote from um, the opening of his abstract, uh, sex abuse, particularly of children, is a crime which any rational person would wish to prevent. However, when an individual's loyalties and responsibilities to an institution put them at odds with preventing sex abuse, it's far too often the institution 
which takes precedence. And that's gonna be a big piece of our discussion today. Uh, Professor Giora has published extensively in the United States and Europe on issues related to the bystander effect, limits of interrogation, complicity, complicity uh, the limits of power, multiculturalism and human rights. Before releasing armies of enablers, he wrote The Crime of Complicity, The Bystander in the Holocaust. I wanna thank you both for joining us. Thank you, thank you for having me and for us. All right, guys, I'm just gonna uh, dig right into uh, what I think will be a meaty discussion. I've had the pleasure of meeting you both before, um, but for those unaware of your work, even though it's out there everywhere in social media and traditional media, uh, begin with just a couple of questions. Um, Amos, I'm always really impressed by your passion. Um, you have been a determined advocate for survivors and um, wondering, you know, oftentimes I, I worked in academia and a lot of it is, um, you know, academic work and the sidelines and it's very quiet and it's very studious and it adds to the canon, but it doesn't get out there with a punch and you've been out there as an activist. What led you to become one? Spending time with, first of all, thank you for having me. The, the easy answer is, spending time with survivors. And I wanna be careful with the language here because I don't wanna make this you know, about me, but there's a sense of maybe responsibility, obligation. Um, when you spend time, obviously, because you know, Vaughn and I have been working together almost a year now. I mean, I don't know if it's hundreds of hours we have together or thousands of hours we have together yeah. by now. Yeah. Oh, I can't count, which is why my parents sent me to law school, but I'm willing to, hazard I guess it's thousands but when you spend time with with people who have had the unimaginable done to them I also by now spend time with parents or families of, of survivors and you feel the the the, the terrible pain obviously um, and I'm very fortunate you know Daphne I the last time anybody laid a hand on me was in eighth grade when Danny DeWolf slapped me playing floor hockey in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So I, you know, I'm in that sense, I'm, I'm privileged, but I'm also aware that survivors you know, feel the need to talk and I'm honored that they reach out to me and that they trust me. And if that leads to the sense of urgency, advocacy, passion, then, you know, it is what it is. And, and I will just add one more thing. The, I think, you know, this, the American Bar Association did a, a profile on me and they said, like, what gets you going? Like, how do you want to be remembered? And I said, pardon my English, right? But I said, I'm like pissed. I mean, I really am. But it's not about the it's not about the assault. It's not the perpetrator that angers me. It's the enabler bystander and the institutional complicity that um, if I had hair to pull out, I probably would pull out. I don't. But that is it's the it's the enablers, the bystanders. Right. that really, in polite English, because we have to be polite, really anger me and fuel my fire, which is, as John knows, you know, I start my day 3.34 in the morning and I go to sleep 11, 12. And again, I've never been touched, but I'm pissed on the behalf of the survivors, not about the perp, but about the bystanders and enablers. Well, you know, uh, using privilege to um, passionately advocate for others is has been a, a real shift in our paradigm in the last couple of years. I mean, for a long time, people are just like, whoops, not me, uh, moving on. And, and when Me Too came along, suddenly it was like, you're either gonna be an ally or you're gonna be, as you say, you're gonna be with the enablers and, and bystanders because you really can't uh, not have a dog in this fight. You either have to step up for people that are being hurt because it is someone you know, it is someone in your family, or you're just gonna hold back and say, hey, hands clean, eighth grade, I'm comfortable. And your comfort um, puts other people in harm's way if you don't use a little bit of that to step forward. So um, we, we honor the work that you do, obviously. Um, and John, um, being such a compatriot with you and, and such a collaborator, um, I mean, here you are in kind of different worlds initially. Uh, you've got a football star, dad, business leader, uh, you know, and, and John, I, I appreciate you also as a man of strength, a man of faith. Uh, your life might have been easier just kind of resting on your laurels and um, going public about um, personal trauma is extremely difficult. Um, you doing so is, is a testament to that strength and commitment to protecting others. And so obviously on behalf of the folks that are, that are here that are maybe in the chat that can't thank you um, verbally, 
I, I want to thank you on their behalf. Um, we always have survivors in our midst. Um, can you briefly share your experience and kind of how you got here, maybe even ending up with your last talk, uh, you know, your first experience coming forward and your last conversation with Amos? So, you know, I, I joke with my best friend and teammate from college. I was like, you know, you started me down this rabbit hole March 26th of 2020 uh, because I hadn't really thought about my daily life at the University of Michigan in 30 years. And when I read the email that he sent me that described what was going on and the cover up and the atrocities, all these memories started flooding back. And so the first thing was I realized that I was a victim. Um, I started reading the response of the institution, Michigan, uh, responses, um, articles in the media. And I thought, you know, I have to control the narrative because no one knows what I, no one was in there but me and the perpetrator uh, in the room where the abuse happened. But I also was listening to, it, it immediately brought me to David and Goliath. Um, it, it, there were, it was just really weird. So I liken it to, if I told someone that my house got robbed, I'm automatically believed. Right. When I told them that I was sexually abused and it was rape at the hands and under the guise of medicine at Michigan, no one believed me. No one believed us. And so I felt like we as victims need to go the extra mile in improving like our trauma, which is really weird to say and um, couple, you know, so in July of last year, I happened to be doing an internet search, just get some answers. And the next thing you know, I, I come upon a, a gentleman named Amos Gior. And not knowing where he is in the world, I just knew this book was coming out and I'd read about some of the other books and I emailed him. And I was like, my name is John Vaughn. I played in Michigan and I'm trying to understand what's going on. And obviously you, you have some expertise and deconstructing, so to speak, or reverse engineering these atrocities from the enablers and, uh, and how complicit, complicity works within these organizations. And, you know, Amos emailed me back. And when we first, I mean, our first talk was on Skype. And that's when I realized that, you know, we're from two different worlds, but the thing that galvanized us is he happened to be, you know, a former, uh, his, his father was a professor at the University of Michigan during this time. He had a love for Michigan. We sparred back and forth about Michigan history and stats and games. And, you know, I was like, okay, this guy is fine from Israel to go to games. Like, okay, he's a fan. Um, but our fandom, we left, our fandom and my love for Michigan at the door. And we began a process of what I, I often say is we reverse engineered actually how a man could be at this university creating these atrocities for over four fifths of my life. We had to look at different areas of organization where he was enabled and how many bystanders just turned the other, you know, other way. Uh, that helped develop my voice. That gave me strength. And then uh, I will tell you, I did look at, um, I think it was in the summer of, you know, the ESPYs when the uh, gymnasts um, received that award. And it kind of put it in perspective that, these aren't isolated cases. And then when you start connecting the dots, especially in the Big Ten, you know, where an athletic trainer was at Ohio State and you know, Ohio State's mired in, and you start looking at the culture, you're like, okay, this is much bigger than me. Right. Um, I was connected with uh, ESPN. I did my first article and interview after about four months of getting to know the, I mean, because the biggest thing, Trust is about vulnerability. 
And I was very vulnerable to Justin uh, Tinsley, who uh, writes for The Undefeated and with ESPN, because I wanted him to understand not only the courage, but the pain and the things that we had to get through um, to be here today. And after that, I think I was, it's almost a relief because you speak the truth, you get it out. Right. And then, you know, after that, I was hearing from individuals from, let's say, the four corners of the earth, and they were telling me their stories and they didn't know me. And so you start to realize that there's a darkness in sport. And for me, outside of music, sport is the purest form of community gathering. It doesn't matter white, black, blue, green, Catholic, Muslim, whatever. I've seen so many communities that are galvanized because of sport um, and the, just the purity of sport. But we have this unpure culture that exists. And, you know, I go back to what my mother, who is now past, once said to me in my early 20s. At some point in time in your life, you're going to be faced with something that's bigger than you. And hopefully how I raised you and the things I taught you you will step up to that challenge. And that's you know, really why I'm here today. And it's what fuels me um, to advocate. I love and that. to speak my truth. I love that, um, you know, sometimes it's just that you don't realize when you're telling somebody a little piece of wisdom, that may be the, the, the little nugget that just sticks in their brain for life, whether you're a parent, whether you're a friend. And a couple of things strike me about what you've been saying. Um, you know, number one, uh, this idea of being believed we'll dig into it a little deeper but i you know i've heard so many people say hey if you're getting attacked right i took i took uh, training uh, self defense training if you're getting raped uh, make sure to scream fire uh, because people will come running for fire, but they're not going to come help you for rape. And I thought, well, that was a that's a harsh lesson uh, early on. Um, and uh, a few other things that that kind of take us out of the norm, or that you reached out. It's um, fascinating to me because so many survivors just stay in the shadows. And the fact that you got information and then started researching almost immediately, like, what is this? What's going on? Who are these people? Uh, finding Amos, um, making the issue bigger than you. Uh, a lot of survivors turn inward and kind of crush inward. And that's not a wrong way to be. That's not a wrong way to feel. But it's also exciting, I think, for people who are in that stage to see when people go outward, when they say, I'm going to get information, I'm going to research, I'm going to be part of change. And if you're not ready to speak, I'll be your voice for a little while. Like I'll carry you on my shoulder for a while. I may need you in the future. Maybe you just as a listening ear or as a friend, but I, I think that's amazing. Um, and Amos, uh, you know, in, in your most recent book, Army of Enablers, that uh, we were just talking a little bit before the event, uh, somebody that didn't even know you were connected to Foundation for Global Sports was talking about this book and, and, and our team at Global Sports was like, I, I know this guy, uh, which is very cool. Um, and uh, you discuss how abusers don't act in a vacuum, uh, that abuse is facilitated by enablers and bystanders. And for people that haven't read the book yet, can you give them a little sense of um, what you mean by bystander and enabler and how they apply to institutions? Absolutely. So I define the, the bystander as the individual who's physically present when harm occurs to another person. And the bystander thereby has both knowledge because they see it and they have capability to act because they have a cell phone. And the only action that uh, is required of them is to dial 911 to alert the authorities as to the danger peril another person is um, in. That's distinguished from the enabler who is not present, but knows, has knowledge or should know of the peril of another and makes the, the conscious decision, the rational decision from their perspective, not to intervene on behalf of the person in peril. For me, in the context of what you're asking, the institutional complicity in time after time after time, whether we're talking about you know John and his um, teammates and the other uh, students and student athletes at Michigan, as, as horrific and, uh, I mean, horrific is an understatement, as, as Dr. Anderson was, from my perspective, Anderson's uh, egregious understatement crimes 
are enabled by the enablers. And those who knew or should have known, and anybody who watched um, John and um, Tad DeLuca and Mr. Goldman yesterday at the press conference in Ann Arbor, they laid it out for you exactly who the enablers were. And those are the people who, from my perspective, create the, the, the um, opportunity repeated over 50 years in Anderson's case for the perpetrator to commit the crime. The title of the book, Armies of Enablers, actually doesn't come from me. It comes from Lindsay Lemke, who was the captain of Michigan State's gymnastics team, who was adamant about the title Armies because she says, as a victim, she was assaulted by Nasser, um, who knows how many hundreds of times, that where, wherever she turned to get help, there was an enabler, plural, protecting Nasser, yes, but more than Nasser, protecting Michigan State. And I think we can make the exact same argument with respect to what John and the hundreds, if not thousands of other um, men and women went through at, 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 Ohio, at Michigan. Anderson was enabled, whether it's the coach, the athletic director, or senior university officials, who knew, we now know they knew, right? And they, and what they did was, I mean, I'm, there's this triangle that for me says institutional complicity, enabling culture, one plus one ends up in two, which is sexual assault or, or sexual abuse, rape. It's, it's A to B to C. And, and the, the thing is that a guy like Anderson or Nasser or Strauss at Ohio State or Catholic priests, I mean, we could go on and on and on. They can act with impunity slash immunity because they know that the enabler will protect them because the enable protects the institution and thereby the perp rather than doing the, the obvious thing, which is to protect John Vaughn. I and mean, it when you really stop and think about it, it is again in polite company, it is so outrageous that rather than protecting Vaughn, they protect Michigan. Um right. and we we know why Michigan's protected because it's the brand, the brand, the brand, the you know the there's huge money involved here, absolutely. But but hang on, I was I was on a call earlier today where somebody in England actually, um, where somebody said yes, there's the money, but there's also a power dynamic, a power imbalance between coach, player, the university, the student, and so this this woman who's a, is a she was an athlete herself. She said as important as money is, she said don't focus only on the money. Take into consideration. I think she's right. The power imbalance. I mean. John Vaughn's a star, okay, but no disrespect to John. If he complains, there's a next man up who's going to come in instead of Vaughn, and the team will continue winning, and the 110,000 fans will continue coming to the games because that's just the way these – it's a system. And in the context of that system, it, complicity enables um, Anderson for over 50 years to assault – I think John and I try to figure out to create some kind of a model. It's tens of thousands of times that Anderson – violated uh, young men and young women in Ann Arbor when he was volunteering to do physical exams in high schools in Ann Arbor, um, and then at Michigan. And the only way you can do that is by having armies of enablers. Yeah, and let, let, let's get a little more specific on those numbers. Our baseline number right now, and it's growing, is 30,000 incidences right. of sexual abuse and rape by one man. And so I think, think, that's, an under, I think that's an powerful. understatement. Yeah, and I think that's an understatement. So think about how powerful that enablement and complicit culture is for someone to gorge on teenagers and young men and women for four plus decades. Absolutely. And when you described the triangulation of all those relationships, guess who's a big problem and all the careers that will fall, all the money that will be lost, all the power structures that are toppled. It's that pesky survivor, right? That person whose voice is going to be a real problem. How much can I pay you off? How can we get rid of this one? That one? Oh, here comes another one. Uh, it's almost until you get a class action lawsuit level of people that are all speaking at the same time that you can even get maybe a headline in a newspaper somewhere in the local sheet on page four. And that's part of the frustration. Um, you know, John, uh, you started to touch on this. Uh, I mean, when you think about 30,000 plus, and that's probably a conservative estimate uh, over years, uh, I'm sure many people 
whether whispering or speaking openly, or as you know, trying to come forward in power structures, can, and they are not believed. And so many people who are listening to this today will hear, well, why didn't they come forward further? And who did? Who doesn't know when they're being hurt? There's so much uh, whataboutism or questioning that people have. And it's so important to just believe survivors, to just step back, listen to what they're saying. Could you go into the importance of believing survivors and uh, listening to their voices and why that is a first step, a crucial first step for institutional accountability? Well, um, the first thing, if you just look at uh, human psychology, no one that I know wants the badge or the scarlet letter of, I'm a rape victim, I'm a sexual abuse victim, right? That, the, especially for men, but also for women. No, like we're not, there's no win in, in, in coming out and, and saying that, like from a public standpoint, because once it's out in the public, everybody, you know, you have all these keyboard bullies and, you know, no one wants that for their life. That's one. And two, the only way we, get to healing is about trust. There's been a major trust that's broken by whatever the institution and the perpetrator that their trust does not exist without vulnerability. And so we're trying to gain back that trust that we openly gave when we decided to sign our letters of intent or when we invited people into our families and our homes and you know, specifically, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a short story. So I was recruited by Les Miles at the University of Michigan. At that time that I was being recruited, my senior year of football, my mother in October had was diagnosed with breast cancer, had breast cancer surgery in November. So as Les is coming to my house, my mother is dealing with breast cancer. When I go to my recruiting trip and meet Bo Schimbeck for the first time in January 1988, he asked about how my mother's doing in my, you know, uh, recovery. Okay, so let's set the table there. Two individuals of power knew that my mother had cancer. Fast forward to August of 1988, my first exam with Dr. Anderson. You know, he's asking me um, all these questions. Uh, we're going through, you know, blood pressure, height, weight, all those things. He starts to now go into the physical part of the exam, you know, checking uh, reflexes and things of that nature. And there's a moment at the end of the exam, which I've heard hundreds of times now, he says, it's now time for me to do a testicular cancer screening test. Will you please drop your pants? or I don't even think he said, please drop your pants. So that's when the first sexual assault happened. And then right after that, he said, now it's time to do a prostate cancer exam. And those words cancer at that time, 18 year old, uh, naive. Well, first of all, at 18, I didn't even know what a prostate was. But my mother is trying to survive cancer. I was terrified of cancer. Right. But I also knew going in that I had to pass this physical to be able to play at the University of Michigan. So I endured these exams because one, cancer scared me. And two, it was a part of the protocol to be able to play at the University of Michigan. Now, fast forward, by the time I left Michigan, um, and I also will say that at that point, as soon as we stepped on campus, we could never see another doctor unless we saw Anderson first. So when I left St. Louis, Missouri in 1980, I never saw my childhood doctor again in my life for any treatment or anything else because we were forbidden to see other doctors. So whether it was strep throat, whether it was for food poisoning, I started feeling like I was getting an ulcer, all these things. I had to go see Dr. Anderson, and that was his MO 
that now that I know since March of 2020 and all the conversations I've had with ex-teammates, players from different eras, other victims, that was his process. And it was always 100% under the guise of medical treatment. You know, That's how that can happen. Jonathan, it, it's interesting that how that mirrors uh, the process in domestic violence where the abuser isolates you. So here you are within a system and yet you have an abuser who's the, a system that's actually supported the isolation, the non uh, checks and balances of their top professional who's playing their game exclusively and uh, you're not able to see all these other people who might say, well, actually, you don't need this kind of test, right? Are you, what, what, what about the, there could have been checks and balances of other professionals. Uh, so I find that an interesting piece in the institutional portion of this. And you, you touched on something about the recruiting process. So this is like the seduction process, right? Uh, come to us, you can be everything here. We've got- We have the best here. medical treatment in everything. the world. And oh, you, absolutely. You said that parents should be part of this process because they're going to be able to help ask the hard questions. And I'm wondering, what are some of those questions? So in, in that experience, what are some of the questions that the parents can ask? As um, recruiting first, as it pertains to parents, and Amos, just jump in, we've, um, we hit a point in our research for as we're writing this book together that we must concentrate on really developing a profile of typical and atypical parents in the recruiting process, because recruiting now even starts in the fifth grade. And so there are things that you, you know, we're, we're, we're creating standards, if you will, and questions that parents can ask. That's one. Um, and two, I think the biggest question is to, um, be as invasive in your questioning of the university as the university is on to you. And so ask questions about every person that is gonna come into contact with your child. My mother, for instance, was a teacher. I remember every recruiting trip I took, she was like, yeah, these, they play football, they win, all that. I need to know where you're gonna be living. What type of food are you going to have? What's the education structure like? Are you gonna have tutors? You need to ask the tough questions of those universities and realize you have the power to not only be interviewed, but you have the power to interview them. And I think Great. as we get through this process, yeah, Amos, you know, if you wanna step in, go uh, through some of the, the more detailed we're, questions we're, that we're, we're asking. So John and I have, have um, interviewed um, parents whose children are athletes who were part of the recruiting process. And I think one of the important um, functions that our book can offer is literally call it a checklist for parents whose children are or will be going through the recruiting process. And I think the word John used was an interesting word, invasive. I think that parents need to understand that when the less miles is of the world come to the living room, they're there for one reason, and that's to convince Vaughn to come to Ann Arbor. Right. And the parents, I understand this, there is, there is a little bit of the starlight and the stargazing, you know, big time coach comes to our living room and all that, that's fine. The parent's responsibility is to protect the child, in many ways, to protect the child from himself or from herself. Because I under, I mean, I obviously was not an athlete. I mean, I played high school sports like everybody else, but right. Um, but I understand that the, the kid gets caught up in, in the world, but it's a romance, right? And I understand that the parents need to be the adults. And the parents need to, you know, sit the coach down and ask him questions like, what percentage of students on your campus are, being, are reporting sexual assaults? What percentage of those sexual assaults are being um, investigated? How many of your players have come forward and reported this, this, or this? How many of your players are, have been accused of being uh, committing sexual assaults? What have you done with players on your team who have been accused of sexual assaults? Turn that all around. Um, talk about the, the medical facilities. For instance, when my, my son or daughter will be seen by Dr. Schmo, is there a chaperone system in place? So some universities now have a chaperone system whereby even if it's a student above 18 years old, has the right to ask that a, another student come with them to be physically present 
during the exam. Yes, there's a way to preserve you know, discretion. There's a way to do that. The question is whether or not the, the parents are going to ask those really, really, really difficult questions. And what do they do when a, when a coach starts you know, hemming and hawing or, right. or not being really forthcoming? And I think one of the things that, again, in the context of the book that John and I are writing, literally creating like, like a, not only a checklist, but a, a star system as a way to, to, if you will, to grade universities that, that when coach X comes and he's not really, you know, forthright, not coming honest about it, that, well, you know, this and that, that's the kind of university that I would like to think that a parent, even though there's that star thing attached to it, would be hesitant to, to you know, suggest to his kid to go there or not to go there. Right. Um, and let me add this. Now, going forward. The facts are that these universities, some of the most notable names in the world, have not policed themselves. Right. And it's going to take, I, I, you know, and I joke with Amos of this title of one of the chapters. I say it's going to take a movement of moms, mother bears letting their children go off to college behind the shields of their father. It's going to take a concerted effort of the entire recruiting sphere to now hold each other accountable but also police it. And we, you know, in the case of Michigan, it was a lawless and unsupervised and almost separate part of an insulated part of the university that obviously from top to bottom did not police itself. No way, but I will, let's take it a step further now because you talked about the army of moms and I agree, love the checklist, love this. This is ground floor but it is um, the preventative piece of, of, again, the child, the parent, everybody who's potentially a victim having to do all the heavy lifting. And we go back to that institution that should have those elements in place. And let's say mom does what your mom did, John. She asks all the right questions. He's going away, wonderful, 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 staying, time, food, what are they eating, what are they doing? She asks the right questions. So now let's say something happens uh, while a, a young person is away. And Amos, I'm thinking about this from the institutional level. Um, somebody comes forward. There's a lot of pressure on that person. Uh, now you're the receptacle. You're not the mom, but you're that person that was a trusted adult that this person came to and said, I got an exam and I, it's not like my regular doctor. I felt a little off, but I don't know. I don't even fit medical stuff. And, and a little conversation starts. And maybe you heard this for two or three folks now, and you've come forward and they've said, yeah, the, these guys don't know, medical, but just go back and, and tell them it's fine. And it, this is a good guy. What uh, are the steps that that person who may feel pretty powerless, often the people that folks come to are lower level staffers or people that they engage with that are, that are less powerful. How can that person facilitate change? As I to think where they are. That, I mean, you're at, that's exactly the question. I think that, um, first of all, the more and more, I mean, first of all, there's mandatory reporting today. But what do you do when, when the person fails in the context of mandatory reporting? Um, you know, there's the carrot and the stick. I'm a firm believer in the stick. And I genuinely believe that regardless of high level, low level, mid level, someone who doesn't protect the Vaughns of the world you know, there needs to be consequences. And by not institutionalizing consequences, what happened to, to Vaughn will happen as we're having this conversation. And I understand that there's always a risk, the, 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 the fear of the risk or the risk of the fear of being a whistleblower. Um, but as we've seen in time after time after time, it's not only the low level employer, employee, when we listened to Vaughn and, and DeLuca and Goldman yesterday, um, you know, they were pretty clear that it was it was uh, Coach Schembechler and, and Athletic Director Canham. Those are not low-level employees. Those are senior. But right. and, and I want to pick up on a, on, a, on a theme that John raised, which is very true in Ann Arbor, at least Ann Arbor then. And I, I want to be, John's right. My dad, my late father taught at Michigan while all this was happening, taught at the medical school. The athletic department was separate from the university. It's a, it is literally an empire unto itself. Um, and there, frankly, was no sense of accountability demanded 
by senior university officials of the athletic department. But it's not only in Michigan. Um, you know, Vaughn was recruited by big time universities, universities across the country. That's a model that, that repeats itself time after time after time. But there's a different issue that I think we might want to get into that. Afternoon. That's the role of the NCA. So if you look really carefully at the NCA, so they penalize, um, no disrespect intended. They'll, they'll, they're, I now saw that they're going to have some kind of investigation, evidently perhaps Arizona State, fine. But they're not going after the really big schools because the really big schools, Daphne, you did this earlier, this, right? I mean, and the question is, is the NCA really going to come down on those who they really need to come down on or those mid-level schools, those mid-level programs? Is the NCA complicit in this stuff? I think John Vaughn was raised his hand and said, yeah, absolutely. And I think, and I think also from our perspective, it's not only the NCA, not only Michigan, but it's also the Big Ten Conference. Um, and those are issues that we're going to address in the book. I think definitely the, the, the employee who now learns that something happens for them to duck behind, oh, I might lose my job or, you know, go team, go my loyalty to the institution. Okay. If there's one thing I've learned in the last, by now three years that I've been working on this project, that doesn't wash. And, right. and we, can't allow, we cannot allow that as an excuse. Well, what if that person, what does that person do? So there's that one person, let's say, let's say it's somebody that's just loading the equipment and they love Michigan and everything, but but they heard somebody's voice and they- Report it up the food chain. Can, you can report yeah, up the absolutely. food chain. You can also report it anonymously. Escalate, escalate, escalate. And, and by the way, Daphne, the you can do it anonymously. The gets the oil. And, well, you and can do, I want to protect, I, yeah. hang on, but I also want to protect the, the, you're right about the guy who's loading the equipment. There are ways today to report anonymously. There's, there's, you know, the internet, um, and we all know how to. And I know Vaughn laughs at my my technological skills. I know, but we all know how to how to file complaints. There are ways to. There are ways if you really take the reporting obligation seriously. There are ways to do it. A hundred percent. And you know, uh, so much of identity. Um, is wrapped up in place and job and who you are and what you do. And so many people are proud to be part of these institutions. Sure. But maybe if they understood from um, a survivor's perspective, because, you know, John was also really proud. John's not trying to sell out Michigan. John was probably uh, with, with the insignia, with the shirt, walking around campus, going to the games, probably supporting other Michigan sports and becoming a Michigan man became part of his identity. And so I wonder... You know, John, as you have to kind of extrapolate that piece of who you are um, to, to the individual John Vaughn, how does that process take, take place? And, and how do you become, you know, get out of that being a cog of the machine of sports and, and Michigan and part of the, the, and become John again and say, whoa, this may be big and this, this isn't who I am necessarily. In fact, Michigan is who's hurting me right now. Right. I think, um, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. If I was to look back on it with how I feel and think as a 50-year-old, um, I would tell the 18-year-old self is that I am more than a number. I do have worth, right? And I will never let them take my name and who I am. And so it's interesting. Back in, you know, my era, you'd come into camp and you were like a number. You go from being a star in your high school to a number until you prove yourself that you're worthy of carrying the wing helmet out there on the field, getting a number on the back of your jersey. Uh, I always find it interesting in sports is the number selection process that, that guys go through. I had this in high school or, or whatnot. Um, we need to get back to, you know, and I just speak for my era at Michigan. Like our class, you know, we had five-star All-Americans, uh, eventual Heisman Trophy winners, several pro, uh, pro, pro players. But we came in and we won our class five straight Big Ten championships. I don't think that's ever been done. And I don't think it's ever been repeated before us or after us. And so we have to go back to understanding that Yes, we play for Michigan, but also Michigan wouldn't be Michigan without all of us players. Right. And, 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 and to look at the money side of sports, and it's kind of a ridiculous analogy but or rhetorical, but I can't remember the last time in my 50 years of life 
on Saturday afternoon at one o'clock, I was watching a science lab at any of these universities. I was watching the football team, which is the number one marketing arm of these institutions. And so we matter. The players do matter. And I think it goes up and beyond your worth is, well, I'm giving you a scholarship and I'm giving you this. But I'm also now on the flip side, giving you my body. I'm playing through pain. I'm playing through fevers. I'm playing through surgeries and illnesses and all these other things. And there needs to be a balance of power. We need to be able to have a voice just like the coaches have a voice. And we have to get away from this do as I say, not as I do. All of these, you know, if you look at just this case specifically, you have a legendary coach that has some of the greatest speeches and phrases and parables in sport. But when you break it all down, several in that organization didn't live up to those words. So you've got to take back your human and civil rights as a person. You know, what's interesting, John, when you were talking about the number and, and my mind just flashed to like how depersonalizing a number is. So during the recruitment uh, process, it's all about you. They're in your personal home, your future. What do you want to be when you grow up, kid? You know, with this education and this, you know, we're going to rip your body to shreds. But when it comes down to, you know, and, and they give you the whole picture and, and, do you like girls? What kind of girls do you? I mean, I mean, they probably talk about everything that you enjoy from your favorite color to your favorite food. Let me get you a couple of those, you know, uh, fried poppers I hear you like. And suddenly you get out on that field, boom, it's a number on your back. And I think about how um, numbers are depersonalized. When you see anybody in a prison mugshot, you got a number. When we, some of the worst elements of, of our history and wars, people are marked with numbers. And um, there's a way that we depersonalize um, people's hearts and souls and we pull the camera way back and I just see a bunch of numbers running around and their stats and the stats are numbers and I think sometimes the more you um, strip people's humanities the more it's a game I mean you think of earliest sports the, the Christians and the Romans and, and these folks fighting lions in, in the in the arena uh, sport has a blood element to it and yet then we say uh, you know pe- people critique the system because it's like fight 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 and then when it comes time to, oh, you're a survivor, someone hurt you, shh, don't say anything, don't fight. So you're, you're trained with all this fight energy and then told to use none of it to fight for yourself. And to me, this is criminal. Um, and Amos, you know, abuse doesn't obviously just happen uh, in the US and the sports system, it's happening everywhere. I wonder if you can um, speak to uh, just that, why we need to uh, criminalize the enabler and the bystander at the state level, at the national level, and at the world level, the global sure. level. I, I think that now that Corona hopefully is, you know, on its death throes, that we, we need to confront the two epidemics that are truly confronting the world. Epidemic number one is the epidemic of sexual abuse worldwide. And I'll give you an example in a second. And the other epidemic is the epidemic of the enabler, because without the enabler, there's no sexual abuse, which is why... Um, I really genuinely believe, or at least I've convinced myself, right, that we need to criminalize the enabler and the bystander. Right. Um, I think I'm right, John. If I'm if I'm misspeak, you'll correct me. By now, either together or individually, we have interacted with people from around 30 different countries on this issue, including people who, and I want to. Um, I think it's important to speak frankly on this issue. I did a webinar and there was um, a woman from Malaysia. I mean, she was clearly Muslim and traditional, you know, with with the head covering. You know, I live in Israel. Um, For a Malaysian woman to openly interact with an Israeli, um, I found that to be extraordinary. And in the same webinar, there was a woman either from Abu Dhabi or Dubai, openly engaging with me and I'm here. I mean, here being Israel. Um, And I said to, I didn't speak directly to them because I wanted to be discreet about it, but I said to the audience, it was a huge audience. 
I said, here's what I've learned, that there may be geopolitics and there may be geopolitical borders, but with respect to sexual abuse, it's, it's borderless. And I know that John's Absolutely. received emails from people who, frankly, are taking an enormous risk emailing him because, you know, you email, you make yourself vulnerable. And do they have fictitious emails? I don't know. I leave the technology to other people. But the fact that these two women, the Malaysian woman and the, the woman from Abu Dhabi, and they, they, you could see them. They're, they were identified by name and by face. I was like, oh. that to me was a powerful, powerful moment um, that told me how, you know, universal this is. And that's why I'm so honored to be testifying in front of the Victoria legislature on this issue. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I, well, I am fully locked in on, on testifying, whether it's in courts or legislatures around the world on the enabler bystander, because I genuinely believe, you know, maybe I've convinced myself that the consequences of institutional complicity are so overwhelmingly dangerous and harmful that if we don't address that, then here's what's going to happen. Uh, the two of you are much younger than me. That if we don't address this, when the two of you are my age, we'll be dealing with the same thing all over again and nothing will ever change. And I think if you were to ask John about the book we're writing, one of the reasons we're writing this book is to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Yeah. Right. And to be writing it while it's all happening, to have a firsthand account of how the, I mean, it's so funny. Um, like how Michigan is still gaslighting us and still grooming us as Michigan men to, I mean, it comes down to something very simple. You know, when they come into your home and they tell your parents, and I know several cases where coaches would actually tell parents, mine and others, yeah, you did a great job here, but they come to Michigan, we're going to help make your man, your son a man. Right. And um, <laughs> which is crazy to me and how you're expected as a student athlete to have more love for the institution than you have for yourself. Yeah. That in itself is a flawed system. Totally flawed right. system. And John, you know, if somebody were, uh, you know, in, in, people that are listening to us right now, we, we can't see them. Uh, they have a sense of anonymity. And, and by the way, any of you that have questions, please put them in uh, the chat box. But you know, John, if, if somebody is sitting there and their hands are in their lap and their heads down, and um, they're having that experience that so many of us have when somebody tells their truth, um, and they say, well, this happened to me. And what would you say to that person right now? Like maybe they don't want to come forward. Maybe they're just sitting there with these feelings and they don't really have anyone to go to right now. What would you say to that hurting heart? I know it's a um, The first thing I would do um, and what I learned to do privately before I actually did it publicly, um, especially when things get dark, I would sit in the mirror and I would say to myself, I am not John Doe, I'm John Vaughn. Over and over and over again until the villainization that these institutions are doing, I took my name back. Yeah. I took my face back. I took my voice back. So, and I called on, this is where I think the Michigans of the world fail is they forget what they trained us. They don't realize I'm built for this. Uh -huh. hmm. And you call on that God-given ability and greatness that has been bestowed on you. And then you speak out. Yeah. And you keep speaking out because I truly believe the squeaky wheel will get the oil. I mean, there was... Relief. I mean, this is interesting. Yesterday we had a, I would say it's a watershed moment in the battle against Michigan. And uh, there have been people that I've talked to every day in this journey. And there were days we didn't even know where the end of the tunnel was to even see the light at the end of the tunnel. But we kept going back to how we were trained in sports. It's like, all right, this is the first quarter. We're filling each other out. 
we have to maintain this intensity until we get into the fourth quarter or the championship rounds, which is going to be a fight. The first thing you need to do is come to the realization that it's going to be a fight and it's probably going to be the biggest fight of your life. Yep. But it's something in you as an athlete whether it's at the high school or the grade school level, it's something in you as an athlete that you learn to push yourself farther. You don't get in the shape until you are tired. So draw on that physical because what the mind can conceive, the body can achieve. That, that's the same as when I was 18 to the same as when I was 50, and I'm 51. I tell my attorney all the time, just give me the ball. Yes. Because that's what I know how to do. Ball. Give Absolutely. me the ball. And that's what I know how to do. John, I got to tell you, as a Michigan fan, I'm intrigued that you used Bo's great line. <laughs> well, you know what? You well, know what? Uh, I would say also, um, in addition to that, even if somebody listening here today is more on the academic side, or maybe they've never even played a sport, um, if you're sitting with that feeling, what John is describing being depersonalized, being a number, um, being uh, having to reclaim your voice and your name, that can happen whether it's one predator who chose you and, and groomed you and brought you into this circumstance of pain and heart and, and where you're, you almost feel dissociated from yourself. It, it, that can happen to one person to one person without an institution involved, but it's still that depersonalization. And there's probably still bystanders and enablers that somehow either by, by not acting or maybe not believing you when you came forth with a little bit, when you tried to give you know a little bit of your story and you felt like you weren't supported. And if you just walk away knowing number one, it is never ever your fault. Number two, as John said, you deserve to reclaim your name, your space and your power in this world. And three, there is something, if you do gain the strength, if you do feel ready, that you can do about this, that you can take action with people who are allies and friends and won't abuse you. Um, Amos, I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about when we- and One more is four. Just one more is four. Yes. Is it doesn't matter what industry you're in. I've heard the term, I was trying to put my game face on. Yeah. Whatever you do, whether it's a teacher, whether it's an, a, a doctor, whether it's a lawyer, we all put our game face on right. to achieve the success that we have in whatever field. So put your game face on. That is that is great advice. And, you know, Amos, I have a, uh, we have a couple questions coming up, but I wanted to kind of wrap up one piece before we get to those questions with... Um, uh, you know, you're, Jonathan has kind of given us a good sense of how to claim back some power and then create change in the world. You're doing it in the work that you're doing and the collaboration together is going to create real change for a lot of people that you may never meet when you start to take it to that legislative level. One of the things I'm really proud of, I have it here in my bookcase, is this pen. It's a signing pen uh, for uh, from the governor's office uh, where I was able to go. Uh, and the work that was done to extend the statute of limitations in Arizona, uh, this is where that pen came from. And so I keep it on my bookcase and uh, I use it for special things, but uh, it is, I may never meet those people, but their lives have changed and they are able to get help because we extended that statute. Tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing, maybe for the people you'll never meet, what you're doing to create that change. For me, the, the, the most important fight in addition to writing you know, the book with Vaughn and other projects, but in terms of the legislative effort, for me, it really is working with legislators, public officials, thought leaders, media, you know, uh, terrific opportunities like this um, to push the envelope on criminalizing the bystander and the enabler. Because absent that, and I do believe in criminalizing, and I believe in holding people accountable, not from a moral perspective, but from a legal perspective. Yep. And so for me, while I'm involved in different projects, different you know, writing projects and different avenues, forums, what it really funnels into is, is criminalizing the bystander and the enabler. Um, I'm well aware of the fact that there, there is pushback that I'm told, well, 
you know, you got to understand, maybe there's, we should have, you know, we should talk with them rather than we should punish them. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. I do understand the importance of, of educating, but I won't be deterred from the effort to also criminalizing. And yes, education is fine. I get that. Um, you know, and I speak to junior high schools and high schools across the country, um, and that's important, critical. Yeah. But so is criminalizing. Well, and when you put teeth to it, um, it's interesting. You know, it, it, it's the uh, it's the action piece. So you can educate until the cows come home. We do a lot of that, but until people start seeing people be put away for these actions, I don't think the education will always seep in, especially if somebody. Uh, is slightly predatory or predatory adjacent. Uh, that's a huge problem. And so, yeah, let, let's see real accountability. Um, I'm getting actually some uh, great questions coming in from our uh, listeners, and I'm going to throw the first one out here. Uh, the first one is these universities are so powerful and people feel voiceless. No one wants to lose their scholarships. Is it ever possible for this to change? Uh, absolutely. I, I believe that. And one of the things that I'm committed to is setting up a system and a support group where if you can't get to me directly to tell your story, to say that I am such and such, I am not Jane or John Doe, we're going to respond and we're going to advocate and to the best of my ability. And it was one commitment that Amos and I made to each other. We will not quit until this eradicated from sports globally. Our job yeah. will not be done. I think I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for John also when I say, pardon my English, we really, really, really don't care who we piss off. I mean, that from, <laughs> it's just you know, not important. I, I appreciate that energy <laughs> because a lot of times we couch things in such careful language no, that it, no. it gets watered down and everything's so cautious and we're tiptoeing around and it makes it seem not as urgent. And I like that you guys have both been coming out, Jonathan, from like the hard hitting, you know, emotional football, intellectual, you're bringing all the, the heavy hitting powerhouse language and Amos, you know, from getting out there and just saying it very much in those raw terms, but then saying, oh, and by the way, here's all my research that I've been doing for years uh, that, that's going to back that up. And uh, I think the combination of, of both of that and the fact that Jonathan, you came for this education and now what you're saying is, I get it now. I'm part of the, the now the collaboration of this academic piece. And let me break it down for people that are just starting the conversation. Cause someone's gonna come to you and say, okay, I tried to read, there were certain footnotes and everything I didn't get here. And you're gonna break it down and you're gonna say, this is what it means. This is what's valuable. And I wanted you to know that uh, somebody wrote in uh, with a question and I like the way it begins that they said, thank you so much for this discussion. Uh, incredibly powerful. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much for saying that to our panelists. Uh, I have concerns about hypothetically an individual who may be a bystander who is also managing their own abuse and not prepared or able to report being further traumatized by being categorized an enabler and criminalized. Wow. It's an excellent point. We took that into consideration um, in the context of the legislation where we have, it's a great question, um, where we created carve outs where uh, if reporting or acting would, would conceivably potentially harm you, then there is um, language that mitigates that. We're well aware of that. We're particularly aware that with respect to domestic violence, where um, partner A or parent A is the, is the violent one, and then the other parent partner is there when the violence occurs. Are they a victim? Are they an enabler? Are they a bystander? And we're very, very careful with that in terms of, of the legislative language. Um, the question is spot on. It is one of the um, challenges in this issue, but I, but there's a but. As, as important as that question is, and I understand it, it in no way minimizes or mitigates the overarching need to criminalize the bystander and the enabler. 
Understood, understood. Well, and one of the elements um, here as well as, you know, sometimes uh, people who have been abused. So way I think about the battered woman syndrome and the way that we approach that and the child welfare agency, understanding that, yeah, the average mother would come forward and support her child, sometimes a battered woman syndrome or folks with extreme mental health issues, uh, people who have, uh, you know, IQ, there's a whole series of things. There's a whole series of issues, but, but, but we took this into consideration in working on the language, the legislative language. Wonderful. That's why we have mitigating and minimi mitigating language. But again, as I say, as important as that point is, and, and the, the person asking the question is spot on, um, it doesn't minimize the, the absolute need to have such legislation. Not at all. And and the, the special cases are exactly why they're special language. But That's right. That's no, exactly in, right. In general, this is happening like, um, unfortunately, it's happening like drive throughs on every block. There is one in uh, four girls, one in six boys. That's right. so, That's um, exactly. Now that we, uh, the, the final question here, uh, now that we understand what bystanders and enablers are, can you tell us what it looks like to be a change maker in an institution? Huh? Great question. I, I look. I look at John Vaughn, and I say, yeah. you know, that's why. <laughs> so, why so? Why I think that the, the tag team between Vaughn and myself works. I mean, we can laugh here, right? Vaughn's this African American star athlete. I'm just, you know, this white guy who writes the books, right? And it, it obviously works because there's something obviously compelling in, this, in, in telling the story together. Yeah. I mean, I'll let John speak first because he clearly is the change agent because he's he. John Vaughn was John Doe, and he said, "The hell with John Doe." I'm John Vaughn. And I think that if you want to talk about a change agent, that's where it begins. But I'll let you turn the question to John and then I'll chime in. Well, and I think, and Amos is extremely humble, but he's also extremely empathetic because he also has written about his parents and their journey out of the Holocaust. So there's a level of empathy that we have for each other that was outside of the sports that kind of galvanized our friendship. And um, there's a particular victim. And, and, and I look at a butterfly when you go from a caterpillar to a butterfly and it's just metamorphosis. There's a victim, current victim in this that um, throughout the last year, the only thing that he could say to me and has said to me is me too. I feel like every time that he reaches out or that he's going to talk, but right now all he can say is me too. But the more you say me too, the more that will metamorphosis, meta, I don't know, the, me, the, the more, the inevitable metamorphosis will be when you say to yourself, I am not John Doe. I am not Jane Doe. I am John Vaughn and whatever your name is, and that is so powerful. So sometimes being a change agent is not, you know, renovating the entire house. Sometimes it's just adding a little color and it takes steps and it's a gradual process. And let's not be, um, let's be realistic about, it. it's also a painful process. There's been a lot of pain that I've had to go through and still am going through and will probably go through for the rest of my life because I realized how much the effect of that abuse has now, when I look back and I go through therapy and I talk to them, how much it affected so many areas of my life. Yeah. But I believe one voice can change the world if a million voices are all speaking the same language at a time. And that's the thing, your courage, your voice, or someone else's that you latch onto, you never know who lives that's going to save. And I tell Amos all the time, not from a physical standpoint, but our relationship has saved my life. Because finding out about what happened at Michigan rock the foundation of things that I have applied to my life since I got on campus in 1988. So just imagine, you know, three 
decades of a foundation that has now crumbled to the ground. Like he helped me to understand what's going on, but also to find that running back from within. Oh. And that's, you know, that's priceless, you know, and it comes a moment in this victim to survivor uh, period that you've got to find that which just brings you back out of the darkness. And most things grow in the sunlight. So remember that. You know, John, I think uh, you are probably that same person to somebody whose only words to you right now are me too. Uh, you're giving, you know, Amos is giving voice to a whole body of research you were seeking. You are giving voice to that guy's experience that he's trying to unpack. And I think both of your voices um, here today have definitely opened a lot of eyes, brought a lot of people into this issue. Um, and if you just had a, a parting phrase or, or something to leave people with, uh, that was a beautiful one, Jonathan. Um, Amos, uh, thank you so much as well. Uh, you both have formed a phenomenal partnership. It's not only going to knock down corrupt systems, but I think it's gonna save a lot of lives and I just, I thank you both. I thank those folks that were brave and sent in questions. Thank you. They were thought provoking and they were smart. Um, special thanks also for the Foundation for Global Sports Development for their amazing philanthropic work and the award-winning Sidewinder Films for telling true stories that give survivors back their voices. Uh, I hope that you will tune in if you have time to our resources and Q&A session. Uh, that will be at 1215, so mere minutes from now, uh, PST, and we'll answer any questions that you have as well as offer prevention strategies and additional resources. You won't want to miss it. And please just consume everything these two guys are putting out into the world. Follow them on social, find the website, get everything you can, because you can be part of armies of saviors, not armies of enablers. So thank you so much. Professor Giora Amos, Jonathan Vaughn, everybody here today. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.